Well, you guys, if you have your sword with you this morning, we're in Hebrews 12, verses 4 to 13. And it's been another week of learning and discovery. What I think I already should have known, but I didn't. It's another personal lesson, especially the last verse, but I'm not telling you until we get there. How many of you ever had someone in your life who taught you by example unconditional love? Somebody. A parent, a grandparent, a dog, a cat. When I was younger, I did some really stupid things. I don't think any of you ever did anything stupid, but when I was young, I did lots of stupid things. And my grandparents and great-grandparents had homesteaded out in the desert in central Washington. And one thing that grew really pro prolifically out there was called cheatgrass. And cheatgrass was this light, light grass that, that when the prairie fires would sweep through central Washington, the cheatgrass burned, you couldn't see it. You couldn't see the flame. All you could see was the heat waves and the smoke. But cheatgrass was so light and so airy that you couldn't see the flame. And I, in my wisdom, one day took my younger sister out into this tall cheatgrass meadow near my grandfather's country store and decided I was going to teach her how to put out fires. <laughs> oh, man. It was awful. It was just awful. And as I saw the heat and the smoke racing outside of my distance and my ability to put it out, the first thing that came to my mind as I looked over at my grandfather's store was not again. Because years and years before I was born, someone had started a fire behind his store and it had burnt his store down. And Grandma and Grandpa had to start over. No insurance back in those days. So I was in a panic and I could hear my grandfather I could hear my mother. I could hear everybody in my mind condemning me for my stupidity. So after everyone had been alerted and my grandfather came out of his country store because he was also the fire chief, and the two volunteer companies of tankers came racing down the hill from two blocks away, and they put the fire out quickly and my brothers and my grandfather and all the volunteer firemen and everybody who was available in that little town of Beverly, Washington. And they all went home covered with soot. And I waited. And I waited. And my mother, my mother saw me and she said, Oh, Johnny, it's not that bad. She could see the pain and the torment in my face the tears, and I thought Grandpa's going to kill me. And she didn't say anything because I think she knew what he was going to do because he had done this as a habit. And this was the first time, and there would be another time that he would do this. But he came home, and I was in the living room, and I was waiting for him. And I was waiting for all hell to break loose and for him to come with a strap and just beat the tar out of me, and just I, I was just expecting the absolute worst because I'd never seen this part of him. But he came to this little 15-year-old young man, and he saw the agony in my face, and he smiled. And he came and he gave me a hug. And as he held me, he whispered in my ear, my mother was standing around the corner watching because she knew what he was going to whisper to me. This was a habit of his to relieve the pain of guilt. He would whisper in my ear, Johnny, I did the same thing when I was your age. <laughs> I forgive you. And he said, you know what, Johnny? In the springtime, all of that burnt metal is going to come back greener than all the sagebrush in the town. And it'll be beautiful. That was my first experience with unconditional love. 
and it was discipline. It was training, and it was a kind of discipline of grace. And that's sometimes how God treats us, a discipline of unconditional love and grace, where sometimes we burden ourselves with guilt and shame more than God ever will. Because he will spank us if we need to be spanked. But he will forgive us forever. Let's pray. Blessed and gracious Heavenly Father, from before the beginning of time when you knew that our hearts would stray and be proud and idolatrous, self-seeking, foolish, prideful, sinful, despicable, deceitful. You made a decision and it wasn't even, there was no hesitation that Jesus Christ, our Savior, your Son, would make that decision that he would die and shed his blood for us and take the curse of sin for us. We are here today, Heavenly Father, because of your grace and your forgiveness and your love and your discipline. We are the people of Faith EMC and you are training us. You are discipling us. Sometimes you're punishing us. But always for one reason and one reason only, and that's because you love us. Because if you didn't love us, you would let us do our own thing. And that's not you. You love us enough to care enough to discipline and train us and teach us the right way to live, the right way to love. And we thank you and praise you, Heavenly Father. We're here today because of your grace. Father, would you please reach into our hearts whether they be free of guilt or full of guilt. And bless us, Heavenly Father, with your forgiveness and cleansing. Let the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse us from all sin and all unrighteousness so that we can be pure and holy and spotless and blameless in your sight because of that pure blood that atonement. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you inspired the author of Hebrews to write these words and to quote Solomon in his wisdom, the most wise man who ever lived and one of the most foolish. And he wrote about your love and your discipline. Father, would you please Open our eyes and ears of our understanding and help us to know your love, your discipline, and how it works in our lives and what you're doing in our lives. Help us to understand you. Help us not to lean on our own understanding and wonder why. But help us, Father, as the teacher said, Learn to understand your ways and accept your ways and be thankful for your ways that it will change us and renew us and that you will metamorphose us, that you will take us from the ugly sinner that we have been, that we were before we met you, before we believed in you and change us into that beautiful butterfly that you created us to be for good works, to serve one another in love, to forgive one another in love, and to accept your discipline and your training with thanksgiving. And then, Father, please help us to be obedient to your word and not just hearers only, and when we go out from here, help us to share your word with someone who is in need, someone who has questions and no answers, because you are the God of all wisdom and all knowledge, and you know the answer to their question. And Father, please fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us to be your comforter to the world. And it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we all say, Amen.
Amen. We're in uh, Hebrews 12, and let's just read it together. I'll read it for you as you read in your text. I'm reading from the NIV, starting at verse 4, Hebrews 12. We don't know the author of Hebrews. Some people think it's Paul, but we just don't know. In all the manuscripts and transcripts, there's only one, and it's not a very reliable one that claims Paul is the author. (coughs) And all of the most reliable transcripts have no author listed. So God inspired someone to write these incredibly wise words. I've entitled this message, God's Love, Limits of Discipline. You remember last week, my message was God's love has limits. The writer says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Verse 8. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. Not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Well, that is a word of encouragement. I'm going to read a poem to you, and I want to do a little bit of explanation before I do. This poem was written by a Quaker, a Quaker minister and poet named Bethia Mosher Furnas from the east coast of the United States, written about the turn of the last century. In this poem, Bethia writes about Michelangelo. She refers to him by his last name. Bondarati. And she talks about a block of marble. Now the story goes that this block of marble was a transparent block. It was one of those with really light colors, almost like an agate or a crystal that you can see partly through. And, uh, and it was, it was uh, in the Sistine Chapel. He was quite young and he'd been there for many, many days. And he was a little bit bored staring at the ceiling. And he was looking at the different things in the workshop down on the floor of the Sistine Chapel. And down on the floor there was on a pallet a huge block of this light colored marble. Sitting all alone in the workshop, he loved to look at all the other artwork around him until one day he set his eyes steadfastly with a straight line of light into the amorphous marble. He saw in that amorphous marble block an angel. He saw it. As clearly as I'm looking at you right now, he looked into that block of amorphous marble, that light-colored marble, and he saw what he was going to bring out of that marble. It took him almost a year. He saw in it an angel and was stirred to free it from its trapped enclosure. Michelangelo's real name was Michelangelo de Lodevecchio Buonarotti Simoni. He lived from 1475 to 1564. And the angel was finished before he was 25. You know, Michelangelo had been, uh, I don't know what the right word is, he had been selected by the greatest sculptors in all of Italy and Florence. Uh, 
When he was 14 years old, they thought he was a genius. Before he was 30, he had carved David, his famous 18-foot black marble sculptor, David, and is still in Florence today. And also that beautiful, beautiful, huge sculpture of Mary holding Jesus after the cross. Bethia wrote this, this uh, poem called Discipline. A block of marble caught the glance of Buonarroti's eyes, which brightened in their solemn deeps like meteor-lighted skies. And one who stood beside him listened, smiling as he heard, for I will make an angel of it, was the sculptor's word. And soon mallet and chisel, sharp the stubborn block assailed, and blow by blow and pang by pang the prisoner unveiled. A brow was lifted high and sure, the wakening eyes outshone. And as the master sharply wrought, a smile broke through the stone. Beneath the chisel's edge, the hair escaped in floating rings, and plumes by plume was slowly freed the sweep of half furled wings. The stately bust and graceful limbs, their marble fetter shed, and where the shapeless block had been, an angel stood instead. O oh, blows that smite, O oh, hurt that pierce this shrinking heart of mine. What are ye but the master's tools forming a work divine? O oh, hope that crumbles to my feet, O oh, joy that mocks and flies, what are you but the clogs that bind my spirit from the skies? Sculptor of souls, I lift to thee encumbered heart and hands. Spare not the chisel. Set me free. However dear the bands. Sometimes discipline is painful, isn't it? Sometimes the way God trains us is full of pain and suffering and sorrow and depression, shame, guilt. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's mental, sometimes it's emotional, and sometimes we think that we're going to go crazy because it's all. And sometimes it's because of our ignorance, and sometimes it's because of our sin, but oftentimes, and more than not, it's God's loving discipline. It means so much. And its lessons last when accompanied with pain. How many of you can think back to the lessons of your youth, how many lessons did you learn without pain? How many lessons did you learn where you didn't have to study? How many lessons did you learn without making a mistake? Without being reprimanded? Even if it was only yourself who did the reprimanding. It is the lesson of pain that lasts in our mind and it's not as though we're asking God, I want the lesson of pain. We always ask for the lesson without pain. We want the lesson of joy and comfort and peace. And we want it right now. But God knows best. He knows the heart of man. He knows the struggle that we're up against. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. When you look back on the chapter just prior to this, you look back at, at uh, chapter 11, and that's that chapter that tells us all about those who struggled and those who shed blood. And so the author is referring back in retrospect. He's, he's looking back at chapter 11, and he's seeing that a lot of people they never saw the promise fulfilled. And even the author of Hebrews says, you know, we won't necessarily see. We haven't yet. Maybe in our lifetime we'll see the coming of Christ, but we haven't yet. And all those people who lived thousands of years before, and those prophets who were sawn in half and tortured and shipwrecked and beaten and imprisoned for their faith, for telling the truth, they never saw the promise fulfilled. They lived by faith. 
And there are many of us who have lived our entire life looking forward to the coming of Christ, looking forward to a day of maturity, looking forward to a time when we didn't have to feel foolish, looking forward to a day without guilt or shame, looking forward to that day that John and Daniel prophesy about saying, someday, someday after we've stood in front of our judge and we've been found innocent because he shed his blood for us. And he judges us for our works. And then there will be no more pain. No more crying. We look forward to those days. But many of us don't look forward to the training in between. It's a struggle. And isn't it interesting that Paul, who some people think wrote this, wrote in Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10 and onward, about the, about the, the warrior's uh, shield and helmet and his tools of defense and his tool of offense, which is prayer. The author says, we have not yet struggled to blood. And Paul talks about fighting the spiritual battle against spiritual forces. Now, you know, some of us have fought the fight physically and we got spankings or switchings for doing things wrong or rebelliously or disobediently. And sometimes we discipline our children or our grandchildren in ways that, that may, they may not like and they might push against. And sometimes those are just psychological, mental, emotional, just being people. But you all know because you know God's word that we fight a spiritual fight. And Paul says that we fight not against flesh and blood, but we fight against principalities and rulers of the air of this dark and evil world because God has given Satan lordship over this world until the time comes that Jesus is Lord. So we fight a spiritual fight. And, and when we pray for each other, we can oftentimes Pray, God, please stand against the powers and principalities and rulers of the air over so-and-so. And then we find out when we talk to that person later that they felt a sense of peace at exactly the same time that we prayed that God would stand against those spiritual forces. And Paul was right. We need to stand against those things, the spiritual things. So the author tells us that there's a struggle but reminds the, the readers of Hebrews, and this letter went out to the Christians all around the Mediterranean, to the Jews, and then to the Gentiles. Your struggle against sin, you haven't resisted to the shedding of blood. So, you know, even though we are surrounded, he says earlier in the previous verses, by a great cloud of witnesses, those witnesses shed blood, and you haven't quite gotten there. Now, who knows, maybe this author was actually writing a letter that would be read by some people around the Mediterranean, some of the Jews in Turkey and North Africa who had been persecuted beyond belief. Some of them might have shed blood, but they would have known that this writer is talking to the general public. Most people had not shed blood because the readers would be alive. And then... In verses 5 through 6, he talks about encouragement. Let's read that. Verses 5 through 6. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. And this is from Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. He says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you because... The Lord disciplines those he loves. The Lord disciplines those he loves. There are many times when our children might look at us after a discipline and say, you don't love me. And usually as parents we say, no, I love you. That's why I'm disciplining you. I'm giving you limits and boundaries because I want you to know that I love you. And I don't want you to just go crazy and be crazy and foolish. And I want you to know that there's safety in limits because I love you. I don't want you to just go crazy and just let you loose. That wouldn't be loving. 
I think I told you once about that 13-year-old girl who came to my counseling office and said, John, please tell my parents to stop spoiling me. I'm just going crazy. She says, please tell my mom and dad that I need boundaries. <laughs> and when I told them, they were just flabbergasted. What? She said that? And they just didn't get it. They were thinking only of what would make them feel better. And they weren't thinking of her at all. And when they heard that message, oh boy, did things change. And at first she didn't like it. And she came back to me and she said, John, would you please tell them to lighten up? And I said, no way. They love you. You asked for boundaries. You got it. Because they love you. And possibly for the first time in her 13 years of life, she realized what real love is. It can be hard. It can be difficult. It can be painful. It sets limits. It says you cannot do anything you want. You can go this far but no further because we love you and we want you to be safe and we want those to be safe around you. Recently I received a, an email from a friend of mine on the East Coast. And it was, uh, it was an email for prayer. And it was from a father and a husband who had just lost his wife in a head-on collision with a drunk driver. And he died. And he was asking for prayer for his family. And he was thanking God that his wife was a born-again believer and his best friend. And he was asking for prayer for the other family. Because he didn't mean for that to happen. He didn't want that to happen. And his family didn't want that to happen. But it did. And so he was praying for love. And for forgiveness and support for that other family. Encouragement. The author of Hebrews wants us to know that God loves us and therefore he disciplines us. He disciplines us because he loves us. Some... Some uh, apologists have argued that Hebrews was written by John because he talks so much about love. Others say it's Paul because he talks about the fight. Well, maybe John and Paul got together and just decided not to tell anybody. Who knows? God knows. Sonship. He encourages us about sonship. Now, all the ladies and women and girls are going to say, but John, the Bible always talks about sons and loving your son and the son inheritance. And why does the Bible do that? Why does God do that? Doesn't God love the women? Doesn't God love girls, ladies, wives, mothers? Yes. And Hebrew and Greek are very interesting languages because in these languages that were written in a patriarchal style, a male genetic style, it meant everyone. And if you were a reader of Hebrew or a reader of Greek, you would know that these words say son, but they mean son and daughter, child, person. In, in Greek and Hebrew, they wrote very male-oriented, but meant everybody. Does that make sense? So you're not left out, ladies, when it says sonship. It means the inheritance. And ladies, women, have the same inheritance as the men. They're just given different roles. Does that make sense? You have the inheritance of the firstborn son. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying here. John Gill, an old 19th century uh, prophet said, all men are not the objects of God's love. Only a special people whom he has chosen in Christ for whom he has given his son when they were sinners and enemies whom he quickens and calls by his grace, he justifies them, pardons them, and accepts them in Christ and whom he causes to love him because he first loved them. These he loves with an everlasting and unchangeable love and in a free and sovereign way 
without any regard to any motive or condition in them. Now these are chastened by him, disciplined, and loved while they are chastened. Their chastening is in love, as appears from the nature of God's love to them, which changes not. From the nature of chastening itself, which is that of a father, from the divine supports granted under it, from the ends of it, which are, among others, that they might be more and more partakers of holiness and not be condemned with the world, and from the issue of it, which is a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, discipline with love. So I don't know if I confused anybody or if I made things clearer, but when the author talks about the son and his inheritance and how the father loves the son and how the old teacher Solomon referred to my son, in the Hebrew he would have said son but meant my children. Do not despise, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. The Lord disciplines those he loves. Gender, it doesn't matter. Age, it doesn't matter. God disciplines those he loves. And then endurance. In verses 7 through 11, the author mentions discipleship, discipline, and training eight times. He says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons, and in the Greek, that means sons, daughters, and children. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. And if you have the King James, it's a a harder phrase. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father, the heavenly Father of our spirits, and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they, brought, as they thought best. And in the Greek, it has the idea of very selfishly. And I don't know about you, but, but sometimes when I was disciplining my children, I did it so that I would feel better. I told them to be quiet so that I could have some peace. I hushed them in a restaurant so that I could feel better and not have people staring at me thinking I'm a lousy father. But that's not how God disciplines us. When he disciplines us, he disciplines us in love because he loves us and he's doing what's best for us. And sometimes we as parents do that. Sometimes we get our act together and we're thinking about the child. But God always does that. God always disciplines and trains us in love of us. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. And then later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And then, fourthly, strength. The author emphasizes strength in verses 12 and 13. That reads, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. That whole idea of enduring God's discipline means that even when we are weak and disabled, we can know God's training because he does it in our spirit. Alvin Douglas, our missions teacher at Prairie Bible Institute back in 1979, taught in in my missions class that there was a woman in Australia who was paraplegic, no, quadriplegic. And she was a born-again believer. And what had happened was she had done like Johnny Erickson, Tata. She had dove into a shallow, she thought it was deep, and, and she was mistaken and hit the bottom of the pool and broke her neck and and immediately went from vivacious, lively, active young woman 
thinking the world was in front of her, like Johnny Erickson thought she was going to be, you know, several different things, a, a rodeo rider, a gymnastics, uh, she was into sports, and then all of a sudden, it was all taken away. Well, this young woman went through the traditional time of depression, a traditional time of, of feeling sorry for herself, and feeling in despair, and wanting to die, and, and she didn't know what to do, and she kept asking God, what can I do with my life? I, I can't move, I can't walk, I can't move my arms. What can I do? And God spoke to her gently every day, the same message, and she heard it from day one. But she didn't listen to it until months and months down the road, and that message was, pray, talk to me, intercede. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Praying Hyde. He was a young missionary to India who died very young. And they say that in his hut uh, that had wooden floors that were made out of oak, uh, there were grooves, two grooves in the floor next to his bed where his knees, <laughs> his knees rested because he prayed hours and hours a day. And he kept a journal of what he prayed for. And at the end of his life, he was in his 30s when he died of a disease. He was praying for 10,000 people in India a day by name. He would have lists and piles of lists of names that he would get through, what do you call it when you go around and you take statistics? Yes. In India, they take the census just like they do here. It may not be as professional or, or technological, and that was 70 years ago. So he had census lists, and he was praying by, um, by town, by city, uh, by, um, what do you call the little vi village, and, and by territory. And during his last few years of life praying Hyde, his followers, his disciples, his helpers, his fellow missionaries said that, that in those places where he had been praying, people were getting born again in astronomical numbers. And if you look at the history of evangelism and church planting in India, about the time of praying Hyde, around 1930 and before, there were huge revivals all throughout India. And some people say, was it one man? No. There were people all over the world praying, but he's one example. And so this young woman knew the story of praying Hyde, and, and she thought, but, but he was mobile. What can I do? And the word kept coming to her, pray, talk to me, intercede. So this young woman, Alban Douglas shares, after months and months of feeling sorry for herself, of being angry, of sad, of depression, being suicidal at times, she finally made a decision that what had happened to her was for good, that it was God's loving discipline. Get this, that God was training her in righteousness and that she knew, like Johnny Erickson writes about in the first chapter of her book, her first book, if God had not taken away her mobility, she would have never become a prayer warrior. She would have never lifted up people's souls to God. And she looked from that moment on when she made that decision that what had happened to her by breaking her neck was God's loving discipline. She, she wrote in her memoirs, or someone wrote for her, that that was the point when she said, okay, I accept your discipline, I accept your love, and I'm going to take my new job seriously. And she began to pray. And the hardest thing for her father, so Alvin Douglas tells the story, the hardest thing for her father wasn't taking care of her. It was supplying her with more names to pray for. <laughs> Strength. Now, I don't know, many of you have heard me complain about my aching back and my feeble knees. Last Sunday, as I sat on the bench in the foyer, my knee went out on me again. And as I left here, when there was nobody else around, I hobbled out the front door, and, and I complained. And I murmured, and I grumbled, and I cried, 
And I said, Lord, please heal me so I have mobility. <laughs> and you know what? I think God was laughing with joy because he knew what I was going to read for today's sermon. Because he knows all things and because he lives outside of our time. As I'm praying for mobility and praying for healing, God knows, well, John, you know next week you're going to be preaching this verse. <laughs> Just wait. And so as I prepared for this message, and I read Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 13, I laughed. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, <coughs> so at the time, so that the lame may not be disabled. So that the lame may not be disabled. Now this is giving us an insight into the way God sees things. We see people who are lame and disabled as being disabled. God does not. Because the spiritual warfare is not physical. And if we are able to pray and to share our faith and to love in our disabled physical state, then we are not disabled. And why does the author of Hebrews say, make level paths for your... You know that if any of you have went to the Rocky Mountains or the Cascades or you've been to the Grand Tetons or you've been to the Himalayas or whatever mountains you've ever been to, if you've ever been to Switzerland and tried hiking in those Swiss Alps, you know that to make level paths for my feet, what exactly does that mean if I live in the mountains? Well, it's not talking physical. It's make spiritual level paths. In other words, have faith. Trust me, I love you. How many people, if we get this message from God's heart that he loves us and in discipline, our physical disabilities are not disabilities at all, but they are boundaries to experience God's love. And when we can't do one thing, we can do something else. And if that one other thing that we do when we are physically disabled is to pray, we are doing the one exact thing that Paul says in Ephesians 6. That is the one offensive weapon that we have against Satan. Prayer. Does that make sense? You guys, I don't know about you, but I am very slow. I am very slow, and it takes me a lot to learn something, and God's very patient. But every time that I preach one of these messages, and God speaks to my heart and my mind and says, John, you've been complaining about your disability. How much are you praying? You're my priest. You are my apostle. What are you doing to share the gospel? How many people are you praying for? How many people are you interceding for? Your whole day goes by. You've got 24 hours in a day. How many minutes do you spend in prayer? And I don't know about you, but God's getting through to me. And I pray for each of you by name every day. You have to let me know what your individual needs are so that I can pray very specifically because God wants us to pray intelligently too. In conclusion, I'd like to just read for you Romans 8, 28 through 30. Romans 8, 28 through 30 answer a question that many people have about why do we suffer? I know that I've addressed it just a little bit, but here's one more affirmation from Paul in Romans 8. We know... And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Those verbs are all past tense. 
God has already redeemed us, saved us, justified us, and glorified us. That's why he can say, that's why the Apostle Paul can say with all confidence that you and I have every spiritual blessing in heavenly places at all times. Because you and I are not bound to this earth, to the physical reality. You and I are bound to another reality, and that's spiritual reality, eternal reality. And because God loves you and me, He loves you so much, He's going to discipline you and me. May God give you and I the grace to listen and obey to that word. When God says, I love you, and what I'm doing to you, what's happening to you, what physically is limiting you is not a boundary at all. Thanks, everybody.